Business Debate on Motion Number 13831 in the name of Jim Eady on the 20th anniversary of the National Cycle Week. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I would also ask guests leaving the gallery to do so quietly, please. And I call on Jim Eady to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to have the opportunity to lead a debate in order to celebrate and pay tribute to the National Cycle Network in Scotland on its 20th anniversary. And I thank members from across the Chamber who have signed the motion in my name. I also warmly welcome constituents who have joined us in the gallery today. The network has grown to be a magnificent asset, covering over 2,500 miles across Scotland, connecting local communities and making it easier for people to choose healthier, cleaner journeys every day. The network now comes within 500 metres of over 40% of Scotland's population, and it is estimated that 120 million trips were made on the network last year alone. This brings benefits to the health and well-being of those people making those journeys, as well as to our environment and our wider economy. This shows that there is a clear demand for safe and attractive walking and cycling routes across the country. The National Cycle Network was created in 1995, after Sustrans received a grant from the newly launched National Lottery. I am grateful to Dave Defoe of Cycling Organisation Spokes for bringing to my attention that the network's history stretches further back. I hope Dave won't mind me mentioning his own commitment to cycling stretches as far back as 1983, when Spoke successfully persuaded the then Scottish Office and Lothian Regional Council to commission J John Grimshaw, the founder of Sustrans, to prepare reports on the potential of disused railways as well as other opportunities to create coherent cycle route networks in Scotland. 1983 also saw the opening of the first cycle route across the meadows in Edinburgh, finally enabling people to cycle toward the city centre without using major roads. Two years later, the Grimshaw Scotland report was published, forming the original concept and inspiration for the National Cycle Network in Scotland. Concluding my history lesson, Spokes Leaflet 26 from autumn 1985 described this as the best news for many years for cyclists in Lothian and many parts of Scotland. The report also helped to inspire the development of the fantastic North Edinburgh Network, which now provides completely traffic-free cycling from Roseburn in the west to Leith in the east. As co-conveners of the Scottish Parliament's cross-party group on cycling, Alison Johnson, Claudia Beamish and I have had the privilege to work with all the relevant organisations in moving cycling up the political agenda. And I also acknowledge the contributions that have been made by Sarah Boyack and John Lamont uh, in taking forward that work. The Cycling Action Plan for Scotland has the key aspiration of getting 10% of all journeys in Scotland to be taken by bike by 2020. While this is ambitious, it is encouraging that Cycling Scotland's 2015 annual monitoring report has shown a 32% increase in levels of cycling since 2003. Edinburgh and Inverness are leading the way, with around 1 in 10 journeys to work currently being taken by bike. However, there can be no doubt that significant further progress will have to be made if this is to become a reality. Keeping this in mind, cycling organisations are gearing up for the, for the 2016 Scottish parliamentary elections. And earlier this year, I hosted a reception in Parliament to launch Scotland on the Move, the actions needed to get more people walking and cycling. There are a number of calls to action which are supported by the active travel community, including Cycling Scotland, the Scottish Cycling Charity, Living Streets, Paths for All, Rambler Scotland, Sustrans and Transform Scotland. But what all these organisations agree on is the need for guaranteed funding, investment in infrastructure and a variety of measures that make our roads safer for people to travel on uh, by foot and by bike. <clears throat> While the network has received the support of successive Scottish governments, local authorities and other partners, it is vital that we see sustained investment in active travel to ensure the momentum behind this demand for walking and cycling continues. Investing in cycling brings a variety of economic, health and environmental benefits. Sustrans, using the World Health Organisation's Health Economic Assessment Tool, has estimated that in 2014 alone, £321 million was saved thanks to the health benefits of walking and cycling. Furthermore, the financial benefit of cycling tourism has been estimated at £230 million by Transform Scotland and Sustrans. 
in terms of the environment, tens of thousands of tonnes of carbon are potentially being saved as a result of the network. The potential CO2 savings of journeys has increased from over 64,000 tonnes in 2013 to over 75,000 tonnes in 2014. Turning to infrastructure, in order to deliver the best infrastructure for cycling, the single most important factor is long-term commitment from the Scottish Government and local authorities. In that regard, I welcome uh, the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan, which reinforces the long-term commitment to support active travel. In July this year, my colleagues Alison Johnson and Claudia Beamish met with the Tran Minister for Transport and the Islands to re request Scottish Government support for the creation of a competitive award for local authorities for an on-road segregated cycle lane project. An award of this nature, which would in effect become an award for exemplar projects, would serve to encourage local authorities to build on the existing cycling network, including on-road segregated segregated cycle lanes such as those found throughout the Netherlands and in Copenhagen. This would be a major incentive in helping to change travel culture and behaviour within our cities and could lead to residents calling for local authorities to take more action to create real safe cycling networks uh, in our urban areas. It is important that we have good transport links to the network, particularly given the growth in cycle tourism that there has been in recent years. And so I was delighted that earlier this month the ScotRail Alliance announced that cycling access is being reinstated at Edinburgh Waverley Station. A new cycle lane and associated infrastructure, including gated barriers at the foot of the, foot of the ramp, road markings and new signage, will be located on the north ramp during this month. However, my appeal to, Scott, uh, to the ScotRail Alliance is to work with organisations such as Spokes and Sustrans in the design of these plans to ensure that the needs of cyclists are properly listened to and acted upon. And while the National Cycling Network offers cyclists a traffic-free environment to travel, cyclists still need to share the roads with motor vehicles. Now, if we are to get more people cycling, we need to make our roads safer, less congested and healthier for the next generation. As I have said previously in this chamber, there are many who want to cycle but feel that the roads are not yet safe enough. The safer we make our roads, the more people will get out of their cars and onto their bikes. I am pleased that the Scottish Government is taking action to encourage this cultural shift on road safety. However, I would like to highlight Cycle Law Scotland's road share campaign for presumed liability. Now, I recognise that we do not yet have a consensus in support of this, either in this chamber or in wider society although it is something that I and other members of the cross-party group support. But we do need to recognise that there is a strong correlation between European nations that operate presumed liability and higher levels of active travel and safer road use. We can all agree that further steps are necessary to build a culture of mutual respect on our roads. Cycling Scotland's work to increase practical cycle awareness for drivers of large vehicles through expanding its training sessions for lorry and bus drivers should also be welcomed. And it's great to see a pilot scheme being rolled out in Edinburgh, which gives these drivers the opportunity to experience the issues cyclists face on the road. Looking to the future generation, every child in Scotland should have the opportunity to learn to ride a bike safely and confidently on our roads. Presiding officer, um, in conclusion, the National Cycling Network is a clear illustration that walking and cycling is one of the best investments any government can make, delivering massive benefits for the health of the nation, the environment and the economy. Members across the chamber, I am sure, will agree with me that we all have a big part to play in supporting the network. I look forward to working alongside colleagues and cycling groups in order to make sure the benefits of the network continue to be delivered now and well into the future. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. This is a popular debate. I'd be grateful if members could keep to four minutes, please. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Fiona MacLeod. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thanks to my colleague and co-convener of the cross-party group for cycling, Jim Eady, for his motion in celebration of the National Cycle Network. I'm pleased to continue to work with him and Alison Johnson uh, in our quest for more active travel and more positive uh, outcomes for people across Scotland and pleased to be in contact with the Minister on a number of issues. 20 years old this year and the NCN has brought significant value to our Scottish economy, our health and our environment. And I would like to take this opportunity also to congratulate Sustrans Scotland 
the communities across Scotland and the local authorities and other bodies who have worked in con contributing to this, to this far-reaching success. Last year, Sustrans estimate that the health benefits of walking and cycling on the network equated to 321 million, as Jim Eady has already highlighted, and I think it's important to reinforce this. While our NHS is under such train, it is clearly vital that we have preventative spend in relation to health and that our different departments should really break down the barriers between them and not be working in silos so that these um, issues can be addressed before people get to the stage of either obesity or um, heart, heart uh, issues and, and those sort of areas. So I think that's very important. A near 3% increase in everyday trips on the network, commuting, shopping and the school run, shows that where people are able, they will adapt to a more sustainable lifestyle. Within my region, South Lanarkshire Council has made considerable improvements to cycling provisions through their local transport strategy, and that goes through until 2023. In rural areas where car dependency often exists, extensions to the NCN can make a considerable impact. And let's remember that it's not everybody in rural areas who has access to or indeed can afford a car or indeed chooses to have one. Journeys on the network potentially saved 75,760 tonnes of CO2 in 2014. The work done will make everyday cycling and walking safer and much more attractive. It would be fantastic to see more children able to cycle or walk to school and recently completed routes through the centre of Les Mahago village in my region make this a reality here. And I commend the Council for its work dedicated to increasing safety, creating cycle parking facilities and better cycle lanes on busier roads. Of course, the magnificence of Scotland's geography means that the NCN does not only cater for purposeful journeys. The ever-growing network, along with mobile technology developments, mean that cycling holidays and day trips can be planned with certainty and, come, and become an option for less experienced cyclists and walkers as well. The opportunity for tourism in this sector must be harnessed, and after the Tour of Britain sped past the Parliament last week, I want to highlight cycling events. In my region last year, the Tour of the Borders brought an estimated 500,000 to the Scottish borders. To generate this kind of strong economic benefit across Scotland, we must ensure that funding is balanced to support smaller events as well. The opening of the Borders Railway is a fantastic opportunity for tourism, and we should seize the chance to integrate the rail line with the network where possible. It is excellent to see a number of stations on the line that are well connected with the network. However, catching the train to Tweedbank when there aren't sometimes going to be enough spaces for cycles is a real issue, which I raised with um, the previous Transport Minister, Keith Brown, uh, when he was in that position uh, nearly two years ago, I think, and which I still think needs to be addressed. So can the Minister uh, have another look at this issue? Designated space on public transport can be limiting for planning cycle trips if people don't have the confidence that they will be able to get on, and especially if they have to pry a book and not be able to be spontaneous. I'm sorry, I'm 20 sorry, years sorry, on, Thank you. the NCN provides us access to parts of Scotland that otherwise wouldn't often be visited. Its growth must be supported to continue the invaluable benefits and active travel more broadly. And I congratulate the, the whole of Scotland who's worked hard on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fiona MacLeod to be followed by Alison Johnston. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I join the other members in thanking Jimmy D in bringing this uh, debate to Parliament? Can I also say to the Chamber, with no disrespect, I have to leave as soon as I make my speech because I'm hosting an event uh, this lunchtime for youth volunteers from my constituency, some of whom have done, done their volunteering by cycling to do old folks' messages for them. So I think it's, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to contribute. I especially wanted to talk about the two routes um, of the National Cycle Network that go through my constituency of Strathkelvin and Bears Den. 
Route 754, which goes along the Forth and Clyde Canal from Bowling to Edinburgh and takes in Westerton, Bishop Briggs, Kirkintilloch and Twecker. And I often talk about the canal as being a thread that runs through my constituency. But of course, the cycle network that's part of that is also a very clear thread going through my constituency. And for myself personally, I think it's very important that we also remember, and it's been mentioned by both the previous speakers, that the cycle network is great for cycling, but it also allows us to get out on our feet and do walking, which is good for our health. And for me, the two uh, parts of the National Cycle Network that go through my constituency are well walked by me and my dog, Rona, the Dalmatian. The other route that goes through my constituency is Route 755, which goes from Drimmon to Glenboig. And part of that is using the old Strathkelvin railway path, and it goes through Lennox Town and Milton of Campsie. And one of the great things about the National uh, Cycle Network is the way, and Strathkelvin railway path shows this, the way that we can use that to join two other networks. Because in 2004, when the John Muir Way, the long distance route was opened up, it includes using part of the Strathkelvin railway path. So you can now go from Helensborough on one coast all the way through to Dunbar on the east coast. And that uh, Strathkelvin railway path has always been also been utilised by the Thomas Muir Heritage Trail. Um, very local to my area, and if I may take the time to give an advert, it's the 250th anniversary of the birth of Thomas Muir, the father of Scottish democracy. And on the 23rd of September, I'm holding a reception in the garden lobby, and on the 3rd of October, there will be a march and rally outside Parliament. In the few minutes that are left to me, I want to pick up on some of the comments that uh, Jimmy Jim made and Claudia Beamish. There was talk about the increase in some areas where 10% of commutes are now done by cycling because of the uh, advantage of having the National Cycle Network. I'm, sh I'm sure I've brought this to the attention of Parliament before, but I'll not miss the opportunity. In Bishop Briggs Primary Schools, through the work of Ed Cycle Co-op, we now have regularly 20% of our primary school children cycling to school. So, you know, when you've got that impetus, when you've got the, being able to use part of the, the National Cycle Network, look what we can do and look where we could be taking it in future. Um, one thing maybe I could leave with the Minister, and uh, I'll read the official report later, is one of the things that Bishop Riggs would really like to do to increase this 20% even further is perhaps looking at designating Bishop Riggs as a 20 mile per hour area. And it's about making it safe and obviously safe for cyclists and walkers. But my understanding through working with Ed Cycle Co-op in this is that the regulations about how we decide what a 20 mile per hour are can be very complicated in order to uh, implement. So can I finish, presiding officer, by again thanking uh, Jimmy D for bringing this and for allowing me to highlight some of the beautiful parts of my constituency. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Alison Johnston to be followed by John Lamont. Thank you, presiding officer. I too would like to thank Jimmy D for giving us the opportunity to debate this this afternoon. And I'd like to thank Jim and my co-convener, other co-convener of the cross-party group on cycling for for the efforts that we've made so far in making sure this, this important issue gets the attention it deserves. I too would like to congratulate all those who've been involved in improving and extending our national cycle network, the Sustrans volunteers, those who are connected with, with other organisations and local authorities. Their work really is making a difference. Um, I've seen improvements in Edinburgh and across my constituency, but it's clear there's still so many opportunities that we can and should harness. Every single time we dig up a road, let's look to see if we can make an improvement for people who walk and people who cycle. Let's have a rolling programme targeted at dangerous or just plain annoying junctions where they don't prioritise walking and cycling. Off-road and separated cycle lanes are vital to help people feel safe and be safe. Um, when looking at a specific example here in Edinburgh, the first phase of the investment linking Edinburgh's meadows to the Innocent Path Cycleway is underway. And it is already making a difference. And it's incredible to think that this National Cycle Network 1 used to involve cycling through 
a little narrow corridor full of wheelie bins and bin bags where you'd come to some railings and have to dismount. And that has been transformed by investment. You can now stay on your bike, get safely across the road. Um, it was started in March and it's still not finished, but I have no doubt that that will really encourage people to cycle and to feel that their children are safe doing so too. And I look forward to work on the western side of the meadows too, which, which unfortunately won't begin until next year. Now, a lot of us in this chamber campaigned about the utterly ridiculous situation at Waverley Station, where cyclists were banned from entering the station. And I'm pleased to note that too is on track to being changed. We do need this cultural change, though, where we don't have to campaign against such, you know, really wrong-headed thinking and decisions, because it's been a frustrating waste of time. And we do want to connect up different forms of transport and use our energy more positively. Leith Walk improvements are in the pipeline too, although they've been a long time coming for residents living and commuting there. Presiding officer, I believe that identifying gaps and improvements in our cycle and walkways is best done by people who use the routes. And walking and cycling is exactly the sort of investment which could best be decided, investment in these could best be decided by participatory budgeting. I mean, what would happen if you handed the whole walking and cycling budget over to a participatory budgeting exercise? I think we'd start to see exactly the sort of improvements people want in their neighbourhoods. And we should be ambitious here. Scotland's network is over 4,000 kilometres long. Denmark has a similar population to Scotland, but over 11,000 kilometres. And this network is across half the land area of Scotland. There will be differences between the networks, but I am just making the point that we should keep our heads up when we are planning our cycling infrastructure. The National Planning Framework 3 includes the National Cycling and Walking Network as a nationally significant development. This is a really positive move. Positive because it was the first time that the MPF recognised distributed developments, ones that happen in lots of different places across the country, rather than just a big piece of kit in one place. And these sort of network developments they benefit people across the country and they should be considered nationally important. The Central Scotland Green Network, um, National Digital Fibre Network and Electricity Transmission Network are other examples of this. But while it's great the walking and cycling, the walking and cycling network is there in the national planning framework as policy, it's vital that walking and cycling improvements are pushed forward with funding attached. The government made clear funding commitments to roads for cars and lorries, so let's see that clear funding commitment for walkers and cyclists too. Um, I Dr. will Close, finish now, um, presiding officer, but I'd be very grateful if the minister could confirm that a commitment to walking and cycling will play a much more significant part in the new infrastructure investment plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mr McGregor, I note that you've withdrawn your request to speak. Can you confirm that you no longer wish to contribute? Well, actually you did, but however, we'll carry on. Thank you. John Lamont to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by congratulating Jim Eady on securing this debate and his very good opening um, speech. As we've heard already, the National Cycle Network is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. The network was founded in 1995 with a view to provide a national network of safe, attractive and high-quality cycle routes. Today, the NCN covers 14,000 miles of connected cycle paths and roads, of which 2,500 miles are here in Scotland, and 40% of the Scottish population live within half a mile of the network. Cycling, promote, cycling promoted and made more accessible by the NCN is extremely important for Scotland and the health of our nation. It is estimated that in Scotland every year, 2,500 deaths can be attributed to low levels of activity, and the National um, Cycle Net Network, by providing safe places um, to get around by bike encourages people to take an active journey to work or school. Travelling by bike or on foot does not only improve the health of those who do so, but helps the health of the economy. People travelling on foot or by bike spend almost a third more in shops than those who travel by car, and by lowering congestion in towns and cities, destinations can become more attractive to, vis to visitors and inward investment. Promoting active travel in the workplace can also help create a healthier and therefore more productive workplace. 
As part of the 20th um, anniversary celebrations of the network, Britain's favourite long-distance route and route of less than 30 miles were selected from a list of nominations. The Edinburgh to Newcastle route, which pass passes through Coburn's Path and Eyemouth in my constituency, was nominated for the long-distance category. Despite none of the Scottish entries winning, they show how fortunate we are here that what brilliant opportunities there are for cycling on paths and some of the most stunning scenery in all of Britain. As a keen cyclist myself, I know that um, it would be much more enjoyable and much more accessible if it was properly signposted and, where possible, off-road cycling routes um, were made more accessible too. In 2014, the National Cycle Network hosted over 100, sorry, 120 million trips on foot or by bike, of which thousands of trips were taken across the Scottish borders. The borders, as well as having numerous cycle routes as part of the national network, has also been host to some exciting cycling events. The Tesco Bank Tour, Tour of the Borders took place in August, and stages three and four of the Viva Tour of Britain travelled through the borders last week. The tour covered many miles in the borders, arriving at Newcastleton and finishing stage three at Flores Castle in Kelso. Stage four passed through Berwickshire, having travelled through some of the most beautiful scenery in Scotland. And these two major events contributed to the local economy. Indeed, Transform Scotland estimated that the value of cycle tourism is up to £239 million each year in Scotland. Presenting officer, many people do, despite the National Cycle Network, feel unsafe on the roads. Research carried out by Sustrans found that 56% of people felt cycling on roads in built-up areas was not safe, and fewer than 20% regularly did this. Some people have complained that the National Cycle Network is in places pure, poorly signposted and not fit for purpose with narrow lanes and poor surfaces. And this is something the network, local authorities and the Scottish Government should look at. While 234 miles of traffic-free and on-road National Cycle Network routes were built or upgraded between 2013 and 2014, continued improvement of the National Cycle Network is needed to ensure that all cycle routes are suitable and safe for cyclists. Hopefully, the National Cycle Network will continue to grow and improve, giving us in Scotland safer and increased enjoyment from cycling. And I hope that this Parliament will continue to promote cycling across Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, can I too congratulate Jimmy Dee on securing this debate for us this afternoon. It is wonderful to celebrate 20 years of our national cycle network. 120 million journeys. What an incredible achievement on foot and bike. As others have mentioned, our national cycle routes are an economic asset to the country for the tourists that come to visit our routes, but also for the rest of us for days out, for short trips. It's a massive tourism benefit, and I think it's absolutely crucial that we record that today. And I think the statistics we've had from Sustrans and from Transform Scotland are good that they are on the record in this chamber. I also want to highlight the health benefits and say that I do believe there's a big social justice benefit to be gained from promoting walking and cycling. It is the most affordable form of transport. And I think our ambition in Scotland should be that everybody has access to high quality routes very close to their home and that they can access our national network easily both the local routes, but also access to greater distances. And I think that access issue is a key point. Within communities, the incremental change that Alison Johnson recorded with better, safer routes for walking and cycling. The issue of the rural connections that Claudia Beamish highlighted. If you look at the map of Scotland, we've had a progressive increase in dedicated routes, in better signposting, and in more continuous routes. And I think that is one of the key points to celebrate in the national network. But if I can pick up one point that Jim Eady made, it was about getting the design right. The national network is fantastic, but we need to get all the connecting points right too. I agree with Jim Eady's points about Waverley. It's important that people who use those routes are actually informing the design of the routes. Waverley access is a classic example of that. But I'd also mention in passing the need to make sure that we cater for both walkers and cyclists. And I think some of the design we're seeing on our roads and pavements is less than optimal. I can think of issues that are challenges in my own constituency, in urban areas where we've got new designations for both walkers and cyclists. And we need to make, it, make sure that both have enough space. 
I, I think it's wrong to take space from pedestrians to cyclists when the pavement is a very narrow pavement. So we need to be making sure, as several colleagues have mentioned, that we continue to increase the level of investment in both walking and in cycling. And that particularly means dedicated routes that are segregated routes. It also means better on-road routes. And that really picks up the point, I think, that John Lamont made about safer access for all. That is crucial. A brief comment on signage, because I think it's, there are many people who are not aware of our cycle network um, and the national infrastructure that's been put in place. I think journey planning is crucial. We need a more integrated approach to ensure that public transport enables you to access the national cycle network, whether it's buses or trains. For walkers, buses is a, it's an easy option. For cyclists, we now have more and more local bike hire options. Again, that feeds into the economic benefit. But I think more can still be done. I welcome the new plans that ABELU have for the integration of cycling on the train network. But let's take this opportunity to do the 20th anniversary. Let's use this as a big promotional opportunity. I know from my own experience, taking trips to North Berwick, Stirling, Falkirk, Fife, the National Cycle Network is a liberating experience because it's a high quality experience. We need to have that across the whole country. I'm very much looking forward to the new Borders Railway Network. I know there are the capacity issues that Claudia Beamish has mentioned and they need to be addressed. Because I can tell you from talking to spokes members in Edinburgh, it's a huge ambition of many of them to be able to get down to the borders. A lot of them are going to cycle all the way back up. Some of the less, the less fit members will be getting the train down, cycling around the borders um, and then coming back up. But it's enabling everyone that access. It's an environmental justice issue. It's a social justice issue. And crucially, it's a massive health and economic benefit for the country. So let's look forward to the next 20 years and hope that there will be an equal celebration because we'll have so many more routes then. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. Our last open debate speaker is Malcolm Chisholm. I congratulate Jim Eady on bringing this uh, motion and, of course, Sistrans and all their great work as we celebrate 20 years uh, of the National Cycling Network. But, of course, as speakers have reminded us, it's for people walking uh, as well as cycling. And in fact, Sistrans tell us that of 121 million trips a year, about 58 million of them are on foot. Now, as many speakers have said, this is hugely beneficial for our health in the first instance, and it strikes me how many of the public health community are now saying, if you're going to do one thing more than anything else for your health, it's more physical activity. The climate change objectives uh, um, have also been highlighted in the, 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 the figures from Sustrans on, on, on CO2 uh, reductions because of the network have been highlighted. There's reduced congestion. It creates a more people-friendly uh, cities in many cases and of course has many economic benefits as well. So I think it contributes to a number of key outcomes in the national policy framework and I hope therefore that the government will continue to fund and hopefully increase uh, the funding. As Jimmy D pointed out there are roughly 2,500 miles of the national cycle network route in Scotland and many of those routes are on local railway uh, lines, old lines, uh, canal footpaths uh, or forest trails and of course Jim Eady highlighted the great North Edinburgh network which uh, um, is, is substantially a large part of which is in my uh, constituency and I've certainly been very pleased to use this uh, network extensively um, in uh, recent times particularly in fact cycling uh, with my young grandchildren because I think one of the benefits of uh, the network is that young children can be encouraged to cycle uh, on the network. Clearly they can't cycle at a young age uh, on uh, the roads and I'm pleased that my five-year-old um, grandson who's just started school goes along the network to school every day either walking or on his uh, bicycle. I think there is an issue about etiquette on the, uh, on the uh, network because it sometimes does worry me with walkers and cyclists together that some cyclists perhaps are not quite as considerate as they should be when they're passing groups of pedestrians, particularly when young children are involved. So I think there is an issue there. But clearly... It is an incredibly positive development, and I'm, I'm most aware of this in cities, because there are major concerns about people actually cycling uh, on, uh, in such a congested city as Edinburgh. But given that, I think it's um, a matter uh, uh, to the great credit of Edinburgh that one in ten journeys to work are already by bike in Edinburgh, and hopefully that will improve as we get uh, the completion, for example, of the uh, development, cycling developments on um, Leith Walk, which 
have been delayed, but uh, will, I'm sure, be a great improvement when they are uh, completed. Now, um, as part of the 2015 20th anniversary celebrations, there was a National Cycle Network Week uh, at the end of June, and I observed uh, that there were a lot of community events uh, connected with that week. And I think this is something that Sustrans highlights as well, because I note that the Sustrans site offers inspiration for walking and cycling, where you can research cycle routes according to your interests and abilities. Routes for families, art trails, routes for nature lovers, urban adventures, and challenge routes for those who want to push themselves physically while making the most of stunning scenery. And it re reminds us of all the, the social advantages of the cycling network, as well as the health advantages, the climate change advantages, and of course the economic ones, which I referred to at the beginning. A Transform Scotland report estimates that mountain biking and leisure cycle tourism combined contribute between 236 million and 358 million per year to the Scottish economy, with a cumulative gross value added of 129 million pounds. So the arguments in favour of cycling and walking and the network are overwhelming and uh, I urge the Scottish Government to look to support active travel and the further development uh, of network uh, in order to further these many positive policy objectives. Many thanks and can I now invite Derek Mackay to respond to the debate minister seven minutes or so please. Thank you very much presiding officer and I, I also congratulate uh, Jim Eady in securing this debate, the celebration of the National Cycle Network, its anniversary of 20 years, and what's become quite a consensual debate about active travel generally, and celebration of walking uh, and cycling. But I don't want to miss out that other category of people, runners, who also use the National Cycle Network. And in that, I'm not the only person with an interest in running. Some, like uh, John Lawant, manage it more than I do. Uh, but I was uh, caught running last night by the Chairman and Chief Executive uh, of Sustrans has evidence to the fact that after the Dynamic Earth event celebrating the 20th anniversary of the National Cycle Network, uh, that living an active uh, lifestyle uh, is important. Uh, in terms of the growth of the route, I think we would all uh, welcome the 2,500 miles and the extensions, of course, to the National Cycle Network. And as Alison Johnston has referred to, the protection and promotion within national planning framework and Sc Scottish planning policy that I was able to do as the appropriate minister then that safeguards many routes. But yes, there's the aspiration to join the dots, to make the connections as well, rather than come to a sudden halt or a stop or a, or a difficult point. But I'd have to challenge all members back to ensure that you equally challenge local authorities, because many of the interventions eh, are local and I will be convening uh, a summit with local authorities and other stakeholders such as health boards later this year so that all our policy interventions and funding decisions are calibrated towards supporting uh, active travel and, and lifestyles. Of course. Can I very much welcome that initiative by the Minister, because I think that point about getting good quality infrastructure across the country is absolutely crucial, and particularly local authorities making sure they have the knowledge, and it's testing it with people that are going to use those routes is absolutely crucial. Minister? And I appreciate the point, and the reason I'm convening the summit is to impress upon local author authorities their responsibility as well in the interventions that the government can make to, for example, the perception that 20 mile per hour zones are too difficult to do. Well, I commend Edinburgh City Council for the work in taking that forward and have republished guidance to try and make it uh, easier. And I'm sure that Fiona McLeod will appreciate that answer and that new guidance when she checks the official report. But back to the National Cycling Network, 120 million trips every year apparently are taken on, on the network. That seems like a phenomenally high figure but to be commended as is the work of the staff and the volunteers at Sustrans and elsewhere who have made such a difference eh, to the network. Last January, indeed this Jan January, I held my first ministerial led transport debate on active travel. I would want to do the same again next year so we can have a full debate on policy and funding uh, around active travel. But I did make a commitment to build upon the record high spend on active travel uh, in the last financial year and exceed that this financial year. And I say that again to put it on the record. And I also put on the record my agreement in principle to the cross-party work around a further exemplar project as described 
by Jamidi. I have explained the circumstances that could allow that to happen, but I again confirm uh, to Parliament that I am entirely in support of an exemplar project because I think the Leaf Walk exemplar project is a good example of how we achieve critical mass and making the connections where people actually want to go for the reasons that we have all uh, given around healthier and greener um, lifestyles. It is about both infrastructure uh, and behaviour change. And in terms of behaviour change, there is an issue around the cultural shift uh, in road safety. I am not convinced by presumed uh, liability, but I am absolutely convinced that there is an issue about how we share uh, the road and the carriageway and the footway infrastructure uh, of our country. So in terms of behaviour change, we've got much more to do. And in terms of infrastructure, then of course, uh, funding will have to be sustained to allow the extension, the improvements to make the right kind of connections between local government and the funding interventions that we make. And it's one of the few remaining ring-fenced funds in this country from Scottish Government to local authorities around safer streets. But there are a range of funding opportunities to support that uh, local and national extension, many of which I want to promote through the summit and our ongoing uh, work. I think we all enjoyed the Dynamic Earth uh, event last night, celebrating with other volunteers the 20th anniversary of the National Cycle Network. But I also particularly look forward to a further extension in terms of Route 78, an emerging route that will go through the Highlands, right through the uh, Great Glen. And I'm looking forward uh, to its completion. In all policy areas, uh, I have put cycling on the agenda. Only a few weeks ago, I met with other ministerial colleagues and their teams uh, around aligning their policy to support that active travel agenda. That included environment ministers, health ministers, uh, which I think members would surely welcome uh, as, as well. So that policy positioning is at the very top um, of Scottish Government. And more practically, with some of the other uh, interventions around how we conduct our business. I think many we members have welcomed uh, Abellio ScotRail's new approach to cycling. Yes, unlocking uh, potential on existing stations, promoting the bike hire schemes uh, that they're doing and looking at capacity to get the balance right. And that will, of course, include Borders Rail and other trains in terms of refurbished stock and new stock. Looking forward to those new trains as well. And embedding the town centre first principle also to show how accessible travel, transport and active travel can work together to support all communities and particularly uh, town centres uh, as well. So in all of that, a celebration of active travel, much more to do. But above uh, that is today's cross-party um, confidence and uh, celebration and support for the National Cycle Network, which has transformed formerly unused routes and railway tracks and paths into something that feels far more positive and vibrant. And in celebrating that positivity, hopefully we can get even more people walking, running and cycling to enjoy healthier lifestyles, their environment and our beautiful country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes Jimmy D's debate on the 20th anniversary of the National Cycle Network in Scotland. And I now suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m.